Hi, I'm Bob. And I'm Sherry. And this is Mostly Politics with Bob and Sherry. And today we have the pleasure to interview a retired school teacher, Mrs. Jane Howard. How are you today? I'm good, Sherry. How are you and Bob? Good, good. Jan, how long were you a teacher before you were retired? So I taught AP US and AP World History and most of uh, the social studies subjects, including government and politics, for about 12 years before I retired. And then I worked for 10 years prior to that with life skills students. We met in 2018, and you have told a group of women that it's time to pay attention to the curriculum at that time. And you also talked about who dictates the curriculum. Would you tell the viewer a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I think that even back then, prior to that, we needed to start paying attention to curriculum and to changes in curriculum. And the main driver behind what dictates curriculum are the textbook companies. And the textbook companies are driven by the states that spend the most on textbooks. So, for example, the state of Texas buys textbooks for all of the students in Texas at one time. So it's not an individual uh, district by district purchase of textbooks. It's statewide. And so generally speaking, textbook manufacturers, textbook printers are going to dictate the curriculum that's in there based on the Texas state standards. And so back in 2018, we were seeing a lot of what was coming in textbooks was coming out of the Texas standards. And the standards are similar, but they do differ a good bit state by state. And so when you're looking at those textbooks, it's really difficult to find a textbook that is different uh, in any appreciable way by any textbook printer. So it doesn't really matter who you're looking at. The textbooks are all going to be very similar because of what drives them. And that's profit for the printer. So Pennsylvania, at the time when you were teaching, is a lot of the textbook is from Texas, not from California, which is another big state. Right. California also buys a lot of textbooks. So the big states, California, Texas, Florida, New York, are the states that buy the most textbooks. And so a lot of what is, what's in those books is driven by the standards from those states. What were some of the things you were seeing at, in 2018 to, to mention, you know, the curriculum? Well, we weren't seeing a lot. If you were really looking for a textbook that dealt uh, with the founding heavily on the Constitution, unless you were looking at a government and politics textbook, you probably weren't going to find that. Um, the other thing that you were seeing as we were moving forward is that the focus was going was very strongly on uh, Democrat presidents, starting probably with FDR moving forward. Even Ronald Reagan was getting kind of uh, short shrifted even back, you know, in 2015, 2018. So you, you weren't seeing a lot of like the Bushes, you weren't seeing a lot of Ronald Reagan. Uh, it was like early on in Obama's presidency, we were seeing heavy emphasis on Obama, even though he was just starting and hadn't accomplished much as president as yet. We were seeing a lot of emphasis on Bill Clinton, but skipping over his problems. So it, it, there was a bias already back then toward the, uh, more toward the Democrat agenda and a focus more on Democrat presidents than on Republicanism or Republican. Mm. What is your perspective on the uh, cr critical race theory that people talked about today? Okay, so critical race theory. Um, I, I really believe that we need to teach all of U.S. history. And that includes some of the pieces that are in critical race theory. I think that there's a tendency on either side to kind of gloss over what we don't like. And so we have to teach everything. We can't focus on just the positives in U.S. history. And believe me, there are many more positives than negatives. But if we don't teach slavery, if we don't teach about the Japanese internment camps, if we don't teach the prejudices that also came along with different immigrants coming to our shores, we're destined to repeat those same problems later on. 
But if we teach that and learn from it, then we can move forward. And we can't look at the past and say, we have to judge everything that's happening in the United States by what happened back then. Because we have to consider perspective. Like, what were the conditions? What were the social mores at the time? And just, yes, it was, no one is going to deny that slavery is a stain on our history. Mm -hmm. That is a given. We don't want to see that happen again. We never want to see a group of people interned in camps because of their ethnicity. Never want to see that happen again. And if we don't teach that, we have that tendency to, to start to blame and to push. And so we need balance. We need to teach the bad as well as the good. When we were growing up, we were teaching world history and Chinese history parallel at the same time. So it really gave a little bit of context and why that happened, what was driven for that happened. And, what, and I felt like that, that's not happening here in the United States. We, we tend to take issues in isolation. And so mm -hmm. speaking to what you just mentioned about the atrocities that the Japanese perpetrated on the Chinese, I always did teach at least a little bit about like the rape of Nanking and what happened in Manchuria. And also I talk about the idea that dropping those atomic bombs saved, conservatively speaking, a million people and lessened the duration of the war by at least a year. Mm -hmm. So you have to look at all of it. You can't look at just the, the pieces that you're either proud of or embarrassed by. I would always try to put that in context. So that's contextualizing history, which we really need to do. We have to look at what was happening in the rest of the world, what social conditions were, what generally people believed at that time, and then move forward from there and kind of dissect it. And so a really good way to teach history, instead of relying solely on textbooks, is to go back to the primary documents, go back to the people that were making the history, and see what they were saying at the time and what was driving their beliefs. So one of the um, issues is that critical race theory is is more than just history. I mean, it's it's a worldview that sort of looks at everything through the prism of power. So white people were in power, so they oppressed minorities. And then it goes back into history and kind of looks for the evidence to support the conclusion. So in a way, it's the same thing as, say, somebody who says, well, America is the greatest country that was ever, so we're only going to look for the positive history. Um, you know, I mean, it ends up teaching partial history, which really isn't history at all. Exactly. And that's what I was saying, is that you have to teach the balance. You have to teach the good with the bad. You have to teach the idea that a lot of issues that arose that caused problems came from a thirst for power. And not every, uh, not every race, not every religion had the option to, to gain power. So you have to look at what happened to switch those balances of power and moving forward, say, okay, this is what we can learn from that. Now, how do we fix this going forward? But you don't, you don't set the conclusion and then go backwards. In your opinion, Jan, Jan why is it that American students, no matter from what zip code or what, what parts of the country, they're failing behind the rest of the world? academically? Um, well, just recently, let's, let's just take a case in point. I, I think that the two years that, uh, that kids were uh, kept out of a classroom to, you know, year and a half, two years, that they were kept out of classrooms, that they, they were pushed into an online learning situation, especially for high school kids. I, well, actually all kids. The little kids weren't learning. The older kids weren't learning. You could log into your computer, and I've heard this from friends of mine that are still actively teaching, that with their high school kids, they would log in, they would block their camera, they would say, okay, I'm here, and then they would go back to bed. And they would go ahead and, and do whatever. So I think, you know, this past graduation year, we probably graduated kids with a ninth grade education. 
for the little ones, even sending kids to, to little ones to school with a mask on, they can't see the teacher's mouth. So they're going to have trouble enunciating. They're going to have trouble picking up facial clues because most of your face is covered. And that is part of the learning for real little ones. <clears throat> and so I, I think that the COVID and the way we handled isolation and COVID in the classrooms contributes to that problem. Prior to that, our kids were falling behind in some zip codes because of lack of parental involvement. I think when parents are invested in education, kids become invested in education. When kids are held to a standard at home, that standard transfers to the classroom. And so when you look at uh, education as a three-legged stool, you have to have the parents involved, you have to have the teacher involved, and you have to have the community involved. And that's what holds up education. And we, in many areas, we're losing the parents. And when you think about it, you know, yes, the teacher is responsible for the kids for this many hours a day, but that teacher's not there at home to make sure that maybe the little ones are being read to, that kids don't go to the library occasionally that they're not just playing video games, that they're actually doing something of value. So again, it's that three-legged stool, and I think sometimes if one of those legs is shaky, our kids are falling behind. And we're also focused on so many other things um, other than just the basics. If you look at the difference between how teaching goes in Oriental countries, uh, in Japan, in Korea, in China, versus in the United States. Curriculum in uh, the Oriental countries is about a mile deep and an inch wide. In the United States, curriculum is probably a mile wide and an inch deep. The, you know, I came to this country for 12th grade. I was an exchange student. When I first entered 12th grade, I thought it was a joke. You know, the kids are very disrespectful to the teacher. Um, they walk in classroom with drinks and food, which that's absolutely not allowed in my in my country, Hong Kong and China. Another uh, biggest thing is um, there was no homework during the holiday. People just okay to go crazy and have a great time. And I was like, this is crazy. How are you at 12th grade? You preparing for college? How are these kids get homerooms? And um, the focus was on prom was on sports. The, all the girls looks like they're in their 20s. I mean, I was like, I thought, this is, this is just crazy. Then when I went to college, I realized the class I took in Hong Kong, the way they tested us is the same way American college tests college students. But the kids that graduated 12th grade to come here had a huge gap. They had a really tough time to adjust. Sure. I, and I, you sound like a baby boomer. <laughs> <laughs> Not a baby boomer. I'm sorry, Jan. Go ahead. That's what, speaking to my generation now, so watch it. Uh, I am too. I'm a late late baby boomer. As am I, but still going to kind of right at that tail end. So, yeah. Uh, so I think I was, as a Chinese mom, I didn't care so much when I was going to college because I thought I have way better competitive edge than the rest of the students. But once I'm my own child, now I'm really frustrated with the American education system. Well, and, you know, if, if that's a, a really good case for having the money follow the student, um, you know, and giving educational choice to the parents. Because I'm sure, you know, there are a lot of families that had they the, the financial wherewithal to send their kids to a private school that was more in line with what they believed as far as education was concerned, it would push public schools to follow that model maybe a little bit more. So I think school choice is a really, really important issue. And what's going to drive that is having the money stay with the school. And if you want the money to stay with the student, those educational institutions are going to have to adapt and teach what the parents want their kids to learn and to be more competitive on a bigger scale. But you have some school districts, um, particularly in this part of Pennsylvania, that are very competitive. And that's because they have a lot of parent involvement. Jen, 
what's your thoughts on uh, the teachers' unions? I mean, some of the criticism of late is that they're so political aligned with the Democrat Party and ideologically left that that influences the schools too much. It did not. I mean, even when I was teaching, you had to belong. If you didn't belong to the union, they still took the dues out of your paycheck anyway. Mm -hmm. There was always a big push to have you contribute more toward the campaigns of Democrat candidates. Republican candidates usually were not looked at very strongly, if at all, by uh, by the teachers unions and the individual building representatives. Uh, I had a problem with that then. Uh, I can understand that the teachers unions help to negotiate contracts that provide for a, uh, a better living, a better financial situation, better benefits, you know, health care, all of those things that really cost a lot. Uh, the teachers union benefits teachers in that way, but I, I do agree, you know, again, teachers unions were becoming political when I was there. My experience has been that they push for uh, Democrat candidates. I can't say what they're doing now because I'm not there. But just from my past experience, um, I refuse to contribute to individual campaigns. I did that from the privacy of my home with my husband, and we supported the candidates who we felt were the best, whether they were Democrat or Republican. I, I have a problem with unions demanding that you contribute or that you support or that you vote a certain way. I mean, that, that's like saying we don't have an Australian ballot anymore, that somebody's looking over your shoulder in the ballot box. That's too much of the political boss system that existed hmm. then. And, you know, you can almost see it coming back in this respect. Mm -hmm. Has a teacher's union always done that? You've been in, in teaching for 20, you taught for 22 years. So what was the difference between the teacher's union 22 years ago and later? As, as... Uh, the longer I was in education, the more political the union. And mm. The unions in two different school districts. So, um, and they were two different unions. One was a, a NFT school district. The other was an NEA school district. And both of them had really were pushing more toward political the, as years went by. So from your perspective now, Ben, retired for a while do you what would you say are some of the greatest strengths of our public education system and and what would be the biggest concerns um the greatest strengths i think that we have some really talented teachers in our buildings and we have some teachers that really really care i would say the majority of the teachers that are, that are in our classrooms are really caring individuals that want the best for their students I think many times they get pushed around a little by administration or by uh, political issues. But generally speaking, those teachers really want what's best and they want the kids to learn. So I would have to say that individually, the teachers are our greatest strength. And in some cases, the districts also, because they have strong parent groups, add to that and build again on that three-legged stool. Some of the weaknesses, I think, in some areas, we have the idea that throwing money at a problem is going to fix the problem, and it just doesn't. So when we have our big school districts like Pittsburgh City, Philadelphia, uh, Harrisburg, those really, really big school districts are spending more dollars per student than some of the smaller school districts and turning out a product and graduating students without an education. So that's probably where we have our weakest issue. And I think that speaks to what Sherry talked about before, the lack of uh, following the rules in school. Uh, you know, dress code, not eating and drinking in the classroom, uh, support for the teachers as far as if there's a teacher that's having a discipline problem, having administration support that, and also getting parent support. Many times the parents are going to come back and say to the teacher, this is your fault. Why didn't you fix this? It's only one part. Yeah, I remember my mother, when I started first grade, took me to my homeroom teacher, and this is in China. She said, this is my daughter. I know her weakness. I know her strength. You have the complete freedom to discipline her as you wish. <laughs> and I come to this country, 
It seems like the parents always think their kids is the best, and their kids can't do anything wrong. It's a very different mentality. It is. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. When I, I mean, when I got in trouble in school, I was afraid to tell my parents. If a teacher was angry at me or disciplined me or punished me, I didn't want to tell. If I did tell them, they would say, "What'd you do wrong?" <laughs> you know, it had to be your fault. But I saw that sort of change. You know, it seemed like there was a, a, a time there where parents just immediately assumed that the, the the schools were at fault, the teachers, and side with the student. And I think that's because there's been a lot of an effort, just kind of like there's been an effort to vilify police and law enforcement with this whole defund the police movement. You know, in, the, in years past, we've had this idea that, you know, teachers... Uh, are teaching because they can't do anything else or they're incapable or they're not as educated or they don't care. And so the attitude at home carries over to school. And so there's a lack of respect for educators as a whole, which also contributes to the problem of our kids underachieving. True. Um, why do you think so many young people that feels... Democratic socialism is a better solution for this country than just stick with the constitutional amendment and continue the path. But like you said, learn from history and learn from our mistakes. Because we're not teaching socialism. We're not teaching socialism. We, we're not teaching what happened when you had power hungry people like Joseph Stalin that conservatively murdered outright more people than Hitler did. I mean, yes. I think, you know, Joseph Stalin conservatively murdered 60, 24 million Russians with forced starvations and those types of things. And the idea that uh, socialism gives everybody the same thing, it, it's not right. That's in that if you had that case, then why, uh, why do you have these oligarchs. What you have in socialism is a two-class society. You have those that have, which are a very, very small minority at the top, and those who have not, which is everybody else. And sure, we have the same of uh, the same as everybody else, but it's the same nothing as everybody else. And we don't teach that. We don't teach the political. You know, we teach that political philosophy. And even Karl Marx said. This is kind of pie in the sky. It's not that it's never going to work because of human frailty and the human condition. So it's a failure on the part, I think, of education as a whole not to teach what socialism really is, not to teach what fascism really is, and to have a strong understanding of what those political theories involve. And what the if they were so successful, why haven't they succeeded? I mean, it, they just don't work. Mm -hmm. So I've been reading about critical race theory, and what I thought found ironic is they traced it back to critical theory developed at the Frankfurt School. They were looking at, you know, the media and, and culture and saying that capitalism, you know, was enslaving people through, you know, advertisements and the media and things. But it, it's just crazy when you think about what that led to. You know, in Russia, or like you said, all the people that died, they were seeing that as the, the promised, you know, uh, what utopian style of government and wanting to see that in the West. Right. Propaganda is a very powerful tool. And so I think, you know, as as kids get older, I know I taught in AP World History. I always taught a, a uh, unit on propaganda and on fascist propaganda and on socialist propaganda and what the Russians did, and how you're able to vilify certain groups of people by the way you present them in the press. And once you get the press to buy into a certain theory, they're going to roll with it. And they're, they're going to buy into whatever the administration wants them to buy into, and that's what they're going to put out there. So it's really no different in many cases than what Pravda was doing in Russia. And I'm mm -hmm. old enough to remember hearing on TV stories about, well, this is what ABC, CBS, NBC is saying. This is what's coming out of the United States. But Pravda, the Russian news organization, has a totally different spin. And, and in Russia and any of the Russian satellite states, they were not allowed to do anything that was beyond what the party propagandists put out. 
that was their news, was the party propagandists. What's interesting to me is um, even in China, they were teaching some of the downfall of socialism. After the 10-year Cultural Revolution, and Deng Xiaoping famously said, I don't care if it's a black cat or white cat, as long as you can make money, is a good cat. As long as you can catch mice, it's a good cat. So he opened up the Chinese economy to be capitalistic. Right. And I recently had a, a conversation with this younger guy. He's, I think, late 20s, right? He'd never been anywhere but in his little Pennsylvania. And I was trying to explain to him, in China, the economy is capitalistic. Some, In some ways, it's more free than the United States. It's not as much rules and regulations. But the government is communism, and he was trying to tell me something different. So I started calling him the Chinese expert. I said, you have never been there. You never lived there. You, but you will tell me all about China. <laughs> I think a lot of, I'm not sure a lot of young kids doesn't even know how China operates, you know. But yeah, my husband and I were in China uh, five years ago, four years ago, before COVID, anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really interesting, the amount of money that is there and the amount of competition for those dollars that's there. But the government still is very controlling as far as what you can and cannot do. It just doesn't right. control what you cannot can and cannot spend on. And so, you know, luxury cars and just jewelry and clothes. And it was all very upscale in the major cities. Mm -hmm. And people were spending money. There's a growing middle class in China. And I think that that's kind of what we're losing in the United States is a middle class. And we need yeah. to have a middle class to continue to thrive. And I think that's what the Chinese see is that economically you need that middle class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, entrepreneurship is highly, um, you know, encouraged and also academic achievement among young people it's highly encouraged even when you're in china the teaching is not as you know there's no the teaching is not like here it's very academically focused well it's drill for skill mostly yeah yeah exactly yeah so well i mean do you have anything to add jan i really don't i really appreciate getting to to talk to you again sherry as we see <laughs> each other every now and then at different political events but Yes. You in this situation. And Bob, it's very nice to meet you. And hopefully we'll see each other again. And I thank you very much for this opportunity to talk about education. And I hope that your audience finds it helpful. Thank Thanks, you so Jan. much. Thank you very much for coming on. My pleasure. You have a great day.